One of the things we saw as we were looking at the passages in the gospel where Jesus talks about his return and what happens at his return is we saw that at the end of things, where it ends, the world is left empty. The Bible has been called this, basic instructions before leaving earth. And what we saw in several of these parables that Jesus taught and other things that are not parables, lessons about his return, is this. Here's the parable of the wheat and tares. In the end, at the return of the master Jesus, all the weeds go into the fire and all the wheat goes into the master's barn. But the field, which represents the world that we live in, is left empty. The world is empty. All the saints go to heaven, all the wicked go to hell, and that's the eternal state. But the world is left empty. All, Jesus also told the parable of the net. In the parable of the net, all the fish in the sea are removed. The rotten fish go into the fiery furnace. The good fish go into vessels that are going home with the fishermen. But the sea, which represents the world, is empty. In the teaching on the final judgment, which is not a parable, he will separate people as sheep and goats. So the sheep are told to come, the goats are told to depart, and the goats go into the eternal fire, and the sheep go into the eternal kingdom once again, and the world is left empty. So in every one of these cases, in the situation of the bridegroom returning to fetch his bride, she goes to live in a new place where she's never been before, to that house that he built, the addition that he's built in his father's house. So in every one of these cases, we have movement away from where we are to a place we've never been, and the world, or whatever represents the world, is left empty. So what about the earth? This brings up questions when people find that this teaching is there in the Bible. They say, isn't the earth our proper home? Shouldn't we stay here on earth for eternity? And why did God put us on the earth anyway? What's the point? What is our purpose for living on the earth? What is the purpose of the earth itself? And if God wanted us to be in heaven, why not just start us out there? And many other questions. These are ones that I've heard. So let's see what the scripture says in answer to these questions. What is the what is our connection to the earth? Is it our proper home? Well, we've looked at several verses that talk about focusing our lives on heaven. As Jesus said, do not lay up treasures on, in, on earth, but lay up treasures in heaven, because where your treasures are, there your heart will be. So our heart should be focused on heaven. We've been raised up and seated with him in the heavenly places, Ephesians chapter 2. In Colossians 1.5, it says, our hope is laid up in heaven. That's what we hope on. And I want to look at one that we saw before in Colossians 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So, we see here that we are to seek what's above, where Christ is. We are to set our mind, just like we set our heart on things above, that our life is hidden with, uh, in the above, <laughs> where we've been raised up and seated with them. So there's a tremendous focus on heaven that we see. And, and we are supposed to be connected to heaven in all these ways. Let, let me uh, review those. Here's how we are to be connected to heaven. Uh, our treasures are to be in heaven. Our heart is to be in heaven. Our seed is in heaven. Our hope is laid up in heaven. We are to seek what is in heaven. Our minds should be set on heaven. And even your life is in heaven. And of course, our Lord Jesus is in heaven. And it says when he appears, when he returns in glory, we will be with him in glory. Not only are we told to focus on heaven, we're given warnings about the earth. We're told, do not lay up your treasures on the earth. Do not lay up, uh, do not set your minds on the earth, but set them on heaven. So why is this? Why this focus so, so much on heaven? What about the earth? Well, what we're going to see as we uh, continue through the scripture is that the earth is not our proper home. Let's look in the Faith Hall of Fame, Hebrews chapter 11. 
in it, we have a list of people who did great acts of faith. Now, not, some of these people, they didn't, they weren't um, godly in everything that they did. Some of them did wicked things and sinful things. But this Hall of Fame reminds us of their great acts of faith, which we are to emulate. This is a model for us to follow. We don't think we don't do everything that these people did because they did some bad things. But in their great acts of faith, they're held up as role models. So, for example, it mentions Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob in the Old Testament. And then we get to verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to, to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. So this helps us answer that question about what's our status with regard to the earth. It says they acknowledge that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. The earth is not our proper home. It is a place where we are strangers and exiles. What were they seeking? Well, things that are above the, the better country, the heavenly one, a, a homeland. So they were seeking a heavenly homeland and recognizing that they were strangers and exiles on earth. And this is a teaching for us. It says if they had been thinking as for their homeland, the place where they came from, they could have just gone back there, right? Abraham came out of Haran. His father, Terah, was born in Ur of the Chaldeans. He could have gone back to either one of those. If that was his homeland, he could have said, well, I'll just go back to Haran. But he didn't. He was seeking a heavenly homeland. So it's saying it's not the, the earthly place that, that, is, that is home. So these people had that focus that we're told to have, to set their minds and their, have their hopes in heavens. They're looking for the heavenly homeland because earth is not our true homeland. And this explains why Jesus is going to return and remove us from the earth and take us home. We're going to our heavenly homeland, as many Christians have uh, understood throughout the, the centuries. This word here, when it says we are strangers and exiles on the earth, the word for strangers is xenos, X-E-N-O-S. In, in English, we have a word xenophobia, spelled with an X. And it refers to someone who um, does, doesn't like outsiders, strangers, people from other places, aliens, foreigners. Uh, Jesus, when he's talking in Matthew 25 about the way that people will be judged, he says, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Same word, xenos in, 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 in Greek. Um, I was an alien, he's saying. Now, there's a certain sense in which Jesus is an alien because he comes from heaven. But um, because we, we looked at that passage, we know it's referring to the body of Christ. How, did pre, how do you receive the body of Christ is how you will be judged at the last judgment. So these people who are coming, bringing the gospel, might be aliens, foreigners. They might seem strange, but if you receive them, you receive Christ. And that's the way that, that that judgment is. So we too are now aliens in this world, alienated from our true home. And since these people in the Hall of uh, Faith Hall of Fame, Hebrews 11, are held up as those we are to emulate, they confessed, you know, the word in, in Greek is confess to being strangers and exiles on the earth. Just like you confess your sins, they confessed it. And that's something that we should be doing too is what the scripture is teaching. I want to share a quote from Malcolm Muggeridge, who is a British um, journalist, but also a Christian. Muggeridge says this, For me, there has always been, and I count it the greatest of all blessings, a window never finally blacked out, a light never finally extinguished. I had a sense, sometimes enormously vivid, that I was a stranger in a strange land, a visitor, not a native a displaced person. The feeling I was surprised to find gave me a great sense of satisfaction, almost of ecstasy. The only ultimate disaster that can befall us, I have come to realize, is to feel ourselves to be at home here on earth. As long as we are aliens, we cannot forget our true homeland. 
So this is, it's quoted uh, in this book uh, that I've seen, I've shown you before, uh, Peter Crave's book on heaven, but this is Malcolm Muggeridge speaking. And he's reminding us that that alienation, that, that acknowledgement that we are strangers and exiles, even better, the feeling, the feeling, the sense that we have, this is not our home, is proper, godly, and something we should never lose track of. Otherwise, we'll end up laying up treasures on earth, which Jesus said not to do. Okay, so this is what the scripture teaches, but why should it be that we're foreigners, aliens, exiles here on earth? We were born on the earth. I mean, I was born in the United States and I'm a U.S. citizen just because I was born here. Aren't we citizens of the earth? Well, we were, but we're not anymore. And our citizenship has been transferred. I want to show you an example of a citizenship transfer in the Bible. We're going to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11. By the way, just a few verses down from where it says we've been raised up and seated in heaven, it says this in verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember, you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So the way it was at, at one time, remember that, at that time you were separated, you were aliens. Aliens uh, from the commonwealth of Israel. Commonwealth is a nation. A commonwealth is a nation. And you were strangers to the covenants of promise. But now, okay, so this is how it is now, but now in Christ Jesus, you've been brought in. You've been brought near. And so whereas you had been strangers and aliens to the commonwealth of Israel, we are now uh, citizens of the true Israel, which the passage then goes on to say, verse 19, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So we had been strangers and aliens to the commonwealth of Israel, to the family of God, to the household family of God. Now, because we are in Christ, we have a new citizenship. We used to not be citizens of uh, the commonwealth of Israel, the household of God. We were exiles, strangers, aliens. Now we've been brought into that household and we are citizens, fellow citizens with the Old Testament saints, with all who've gone before. And we are now members of the household of God and citizens in the commonwealth of Israel, the new Israel that is in Christ that I've talked about. So our citizenship has been transferred in that way. All right. So what about the earth? If we were born on the earth and, but all these other things say we're strangers and exiles, what happened? What happened? Well, our citizenship has been transferred and we see that specifically called out in the scripture. We're going to go to Colossians. Now, I had earlier just mentioned in verse five, it says that our hope is laid up in heaven. But when we go down to verse 13, not much farther from there. It says this of God, verse 13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So this transfer to the kingdom is a change of citizenship. We've been delivered out of a domain. A domain is, is, is a kind of nation too, right? We see a transfer being pictured here like someone who emigrates out of their native land and goes to a new land and gets citizenship there, an immigrant who becomes naturalized. We've left this place called the domain of darkness, a, a nation, you know, the, the enemy's nation, and our citizenship has been transferred into the kingdom of Christ, which is the new nation of which we have citizenship. And God is the one who does this. When we come to faith in Christ, we are no longer citizens of the earth or of the world system that's set in rebellion against God, the domain of darkness. We're now citizens of the kingdom of heaven, 
also known as the kingdom of God or the kingdom of Christ, our citizenship has been transferred. So this is wonderful, by the way. Thank you, Jesus, for, for delivering us from the domain of darkness, because that's not a good place to be. And on Judgment Day, if you were a citizen of that kingdom, you, you don't going to like where you're going to go. Yes, we were citizens of the earth by our by being born here, but now we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven by being reborn, born again into the kingdom, having been raised up and seated with Christ in the heavenly places. And this is why the book of Revelation calls us heaven dwellers. All right, so does it say that also? Uh, I we can actually confirm this citizenship transfer in Philippians chapter three and verse twenty. It says this. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to stop there for now, but we'll come back later. So our citizenship is in heaven. Why? Because it's been transferred there. We're no longer citizens of the earth. We're citizens of heaven. So what is our status here on the earth? Strangers, exiles, aliens, foreigners. <laughs> and that's why the saints in Hebrews 11 say, they acknowledged, they confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. And that example is held up for us so that we can know the earth. No, it's not our proper homeland. Yes, we live here and we are to continue to live here. But now that heaven is our homeland and, and that's where we're going, that's where our hope is laid up. That's our heavenly homeland. We are strangers, foreigners, exiles here. And notice in this passage, it says, from heaven, we await our Savior, Jesus Christ, who we know from all those other teachings that I've gone through before, he's going to take us to heaven, just as the bridegroom comes to fetch his bride and take her to the place prepared. And the fish are, are taken home with the fishermen. The wheat is taken into the father's barn, uh, which is on the master's homestead. So in all these examples, he gives us, well, why would that be? Because that's uh, to teach us that we're going to our heavenly homeland and we are, but that we are strangers and exiles here. And so our, our first transfer of citizenship actually foreshadows the second one. We've been transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of Christ, and we will at his return be transferred from the earth into our heavenly homeland. Uh, and that's a, a beautiful picture. Now, so if earth is not our proper homeland, does that mean we shouldn't uh, appreciate it? Uh, should you just check out from the earth, right? Become a hermit or an ascetic, as they call them, somebody who um, just gives up all things that are earthly, worldly, all possessions and, you know, go around like, that. well, you could, I suppose, if it's long, it was honoring God, but it's by no means required. In fact, we shouldn't check out from the world and ignore the problems here and say, oh, I'm just a heavenly creature. We have a, an example in the scripture that teaches us this principle. In the Babylonian exile, when the people of Israel were taken to Babylon for 70 years, uh, they were removed from their home and they went to live in Babylon where they were strangers and exiles in Babylon. And the, they had some prophets who were saying, don't bother to put down roots here. Don't, don't get involved. We're going right back. God is going to come. They were false prophets. God sent a message by his true prophet, Jeremiah, to the exiles. And here's what he said. We're in Jeremiah 29, verse 4. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you in exile and pray to Yahweh on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. So God, having sent them into this foreign place that's conquered their, their land, burned down their city of Jerusalem and the temple, God says, don't, don't check out from Babylon. Be good citizens there. Seek the blessing of Babylon. Do you know, Put down roots. Get involved. Pray for the blessings of, to come on Babylon. How hard would that be? Your enemy's nation that's come and conquered you and burned down your city and carried you away to captivity, and you're told by God, pray for them. 
pray for them. Well, Jesus said, even pray for those who persecute you. Here's an example, a living example. So we take that principle then and say, although we're strangers and exiles here on the earth, we don't check out from the earth. We don't say, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to get concerned with these problems. No, Jesus said, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit those who are sick and in prison, love your neighbor. You can't do that and check out and say, la, 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 I'm a citizen of heaven. And we are citizens of heaven, but we are here now. We're here now. The scripture calls us ambassadors for Christ. What do ambassadors do? They live in a foreign land, yet they seek a, a blessing to that land. They seek to represent their homeland and tell people about it. Yeah, the, hey, the homeland's a great place. But to reconcile these two peoples, to smooth out their, their differences. We got to be ambassadors in this world, even though we're strangers and exiles here. And yes, our homeland is in heaven, but we live here. We, we put down roots and we, we pray for the blessing of the world and for the people in it. But we know that someday we're going home. So don't forget that sense of alienation, all right? So we have this perfect balance here that we're seeking. All right. Uh, I want to show you a couple more places where we find this description of us as strangers and exiles. Peter is writing to the Christians in his epistle, 1 Peter. And he says this, 1 Peter 1, 17. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So he's talking to living people alive on the earth, and he says, be be fearful, be reverent during your time of exile, this time in which we live on the earth. Why is that? Because we were ransomed um, out of the domain of darkness, by the way, <laughs> and delivered into the kingdom of the sun. And the price that was paid was a hefty price. It was the death of the son of God. It was the blood of Christ, the perfect lamb, that purchased us out of the domain of darkness this and brought us into the kingdom of his beloved son christ transferred our citizenship to heaven therefore the way we live while we're here in exile is to be fearful be reverent and and be uh, conduct yourselves uh, properly as someone who for whom such a price was paid a hefty price was paid for you but he also says this is our time of exile just as the hebrews 11 says we are strangers and exiles on the earth Earth is not our homeland. On Judgment Day, the last day when Jesus returns, we go home. Later on in the same book, chapter 2, Peter brings up this topic again. He says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So here again, he says we are sojourners and exiles. That's just like strangers and exiles that we saw in Hebrews 11. And because we are, then you should put away those passions of the flesh. It, in in uh, The way I would translate it is fleshly desires, even lusts. Right? Put away those lusts, those fleshly desires. Why? We're citizens of heaven now, and we have to have our heart and our minds and our, our hope uh, set in heaven, even though we live here. But by living here as people who conduct ourselves in a godly, fearful uh, way, that is our witness to the world. That is how we are ambassadors for Christ. That is how people become attracted to the kingdom, and they say, I want to be a citizen too. I want to leave this domain of darkness. How do I get out? And then we can tell them about uh, faith in Christ and, and, and all the things it does. So here again, we see that language, sojourners and, sojourners and exiles on the earth, strangers and exiles on the earth, and how we should behave as a result of it. We don't check out. We do bless the, the world and we do witness and evangelize, but we also live in a godly way because of the, the tremendous price that was paid for us to enter into the service to, to Christ. Now, what about the Old Testament saints? Did any of them know about this, that we were strangers and exiles on the earth, that, um, that, uh, that, that we had a heavenly homeland? Yeah, let me show you some examples of that. So you can see it's not just a brand new thing that was invented by <laughs> New Testament people. 
In 1 Chronicles 29, King David has assembled his staff, the nobles and the, the, the officials, and he's, he's saying that his son is going to build the temple. He's not going to. He says this in verse 14 when he prays to God, but who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you and of your own have we given you. For we are strangers before you and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow and there is no abiding. So he says, we are strangers and sojourners. So that's just like saying strangers and exiles. And it's about our days on the earth, our days on the earth. They're like a shadow. They're fleeting and no one uh, abides. Abide means remains. No one is going to remain. So yeah, we this was known about in Old Testament times. Uh, look at Psalm 119. In verse 18, it says, Open my eyes that I may behold your uh, wondrous things out of your law. I am a sojourner on the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. So the psalmist knows that he's a sojourner, not a permanent resident. Psalm 73, another psalm. Uh, what about going to our heavenly homeland? Yeah, here's one. He says, you guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you, and there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. So just as, as Jesus said, don't lay up treasures on earth. The psalmist here says, I don't have any desires for the things of the earth that I would give up God for. There's nothing besides God that I would accept on the earth as a replacement, as a substitute. And he says, afterward, after this life, you will receive me to glory, right? We know from the passage I read you early, when Christ appears, then in glory, we will be with him in glory. So we're waiting for the return of Christ. And this, this word for receive is like welcome, take in. Just as the bridegroom comes to welcome and take in his bride into that place that he's prepared for them to live. So we see, yes, these pictures are in the Old Testament. They were aware that we are strangers and exiles on the earth and that there was a heavenly homeland that we were headed for. And there's one more Old uh, Testament example that I want to use, and that is the Exodus. The Exodus, you know, back to Hebrews 11, when it talks of being strangers and exiles, that's actually a callback to the Exodus. That's Old Testament language. It's a, there's a motif there, a pattern by which we can recognize what we're given in the New Testament. And, and it's not surprising, almost every point in uh, Hebrews is taught by looking at an Old Testament example. So our egg being exiles on earth is also a type, is, is shown in type by the, um, the Exodus, the Exodus. Because Abraham went to live in Canaan, and then he was told by God that he would be given the land of Canaan, but Abraham wasn't given anything. It went to his offspring. So let's go to Genesis 15 and see the promise that God made to Abraham about the offspring. Verse 13, Then Yahweh said to Abraham, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Verse 16, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So the offspring of Abraham are going to go into a sojourn. They're going to be foreigners and exiles in a land that is not theirs. We know that that's Egypt and they're going to be afflicted there, but they're, God is going to bring them out and then bring them into the promised land. They shall come back here, here being Canaan, their promised land. And the, who does this have, uh, happen to? Abraham's offspring. Now, who in the New Testament, who is Abraham's offspring? We are, the Christians, says that in Galatians 3.29. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. So what happened to Abraham's offspring in the Old Testament is a picture, a type of what will be happening to us. So the, the Israelites lived in Egypt where they were sojourners, strangers and exiles in Egypt, and they were enslaved to Pharaoh, but God brought them out of slavery by Moses. Uh, he led them out of the house of bondage, as it was called, 
And yet they didn't immediately go into the promised land. They, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, one generation. And the wilderness was not their homeland either. So they were still sojourning in the wilderness, wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. But then finally, God brought them into the promised land through Joshua. Joshua led them into the promised land. Now, all these things are a pattern that we as Christians follow. So the Old Testament exodus is a picture of our exile here on earth and our deliverance into our heavenly homeland. Let's look at those parallels in a chart. All right, so we have the Israelites on the left, Christians on the right. They were the seed of Abraham. We are also the seed of Abraham. They were sojourners in a foreign land, Egypt. We were sojourners in a foreign land, the domain of darkness. They were slaves to Pharaoh. We were slaves to sin and death, as Jesus said. They were greatly afflicted in bondage, and we are greatly afflicted when we're in bondage to the enemy. They were led out of slavery by Moses in the Exodus. They out of the house of bondage. That's what Jesus, uh, God said to them. We've been led out by Jesus in a new Exodus, out of bondage to sin and death. They came out with great earthly wealth. They had material treasures, gold, silver, whatever. But we've come out of the domain of darkness with great heavenly wealth. We have the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have forgiveness of sins. We have reconciliation to God. We have the power of the Spirit in us. We have much wealth in Christ, but it's not material wealth. They, the ancient Israelites, wandered in the wilderness for one generation. Exiles there, sojourners, and we wander on earth as strangers and exiles on the earth. Also for one generation, the rest of your life, whatever it's going to be. And they were finally led into the promised land, Canaan, for them, by Yehoshua. That's how you say Joshua in Hebrew. And we've been led into the promised land, or we will be at his return. We will be led into our promised land, heaven, by Yeshua. Yeshua is the short form of Yehoshua. So what Joshua did in the Old Testament, our Jesus will do now. So in all these ways, we see that the Old Testament exodus is a, a type of picture of what's going to happen with us. How amazing is that? We have the pattern by which we can know all these things and, and see the kind of um, the outline of, of our salvation history and, our, and how our life will go. And this is why it's so important that the world is left empty and all those teachings that Jesus gives. Because we have to be removed from this world and taken to heaven for eternity because that's what God has promised us and he will fulfill his promise to us just like he did to the ancient Israelites. Imagine this. What if the Israelites were still wandering around the desert for 3,400 years? They've been wandering around saying, any day now God's going to take us into our homeland. What would people think? They'd say, that God isn't real. You you people are hopeless. I mean, I mean, you should you should have given up a long time ago. But God delivered them into their promised land as a as a picture, as a demonstration of his faithfulness to the promises that he makes, that he will remove them from exile and give them a home, give them their inheritance. All right. So let's review. When Jesus returns, everyone is removed. We are all leaving the earth, <laughs> living and dead, righteous and wicked. And are we citizens of earth? No. We were at birth. But our citizenship has been transferred when we come to faith in Christ, and now we're citizens of heaven. Just as the Israelites, you could say their citizenship was translated, uh, transferred from Egypt to Canaan, even though they hadn't physically gone to live there yet. Is the earth our true homeland? No. Heaven is our true homeland. Therefore, we are now strangers and exiles here, sojourners, aliens, and we are ambassadors for Christ and for the kingdom of Christ. Did the Old Testament saints know this? Yes, they knew it. They even had the Exodus as a living example. Some of them lived through it. Because just as Israel wandered in the wilderness for a generation, we wander on earth as exiles for a generation. Just as they were taken into the promised land, we will be taken into our promised land, heaven. And now there's some questions I haven't answered. Those will have to wait for future lessons. But I want to review the many of the things we've learned today 
about how we should live during a time of exile. So here are some tips for living in exile on earth from the scripture, not me. Cultivate your connection to heaven. Seek the things above. Your heart and your treasures and your hope is laid up in heaven and your mind is set on heavenly things. Our life is there. Be connected to heaven. Confess to being a stranger in exile, just like the great saints did. Recognize that you're now a citizen of heaven. That should change the way you live. I think of that myself, that I'm a citizen of heaven. How different should we live? As he said, conduct yourself with fear during this time, this time of exile, Peter says. Remember, well, the price that was paid, the hefty price that was paid to ransom you out of the domain of darkness. How should you live reverently, fearful? Push away the fleshly desires. They make war on your soul. Your, your, your flesh is not going to last forever. Your soul is. So don't let your flesh, which is temporary, afflict your soul, which is permanent. Push away those fleshly desires. Seek the welfare of the world, the principle we get from Jeremiah 29. We don't check out. Even though we're exiles and strangers here, we bless the place where we live, just as they did. And we are waiting for the Savior, Jesus, who will return from heaven. So that's a hope that we have for the future. And though it's not in the scripture, I think it's clear that what Muggeridge says is, is the correct thing. Never forget, never lose that sense of alienation. Don't get too comfy here. <laughs> we are to bless the world and, and be in the world, but not of the world. Don't get, don't get sucked down into being of the world. And I want to end with one last question quotation from John Stott, a British theologian. He gave this in, in a lecture talk to that kind of summarizes many of the things that we've just talked about today. Stott says this, lift up your eyes. You are certainly a creature of time, but you are also a child of eternity. You are a citizen of heaven and an alien at exile on earth, a pilgrim traveling to the celestial city. I read some years ago of a young man who found a $5 bill on the street and who from that time on never lifted his eyes when walking. In the course of years, he accumulated 29,516 buttons, 54,172 pins, 12 cents, and a bent back and a miserly disposition. But think of what he lost. He couldn't see the radiance of the sunlight and sheen of the stars, the smile on the face of his friends or the blossoms of springtime, for his eyes were in the gutter. There are too many Christians like that. We have important duties on earth, but we must never allow them to preoccupy us in such a way that we forget who we are or where we are going. So he also says, don't check out of the earth. We have things to do here, but don't get too comfortable. When we fix our heart and our mind and our treasures in heaven, then we will feel that sense of alienation. It will just happen like Muggridge. And that's right and proper because we are strangers and exiles on the earth. And that's the lesson for today. I hope it's been a blessing. Now I'd like to hear your comments and or questions.